Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's, today's webinar, which will cover Alyssa's Law, its requirements, and also its effects on schools. My name is Amy Rock, and I'm Campus Safety Senior Editor. Um, I will be today's webinar moderator, and today's webinar is sponsored by Syntegix. And before we get started, we'll just go over some housekeeping items on how today will go. First, if you're having trouble hearing the presentation, you can simply click on the question mark in the upper corner of the interface, excuse me, and select Test My System Now. We also want to encourage you to ask questions throughout the webcast because we're going to do a Q&A at the end with our presenters. And you can submit questions at any point during the presentation on the left side of your screen where it says, ask a question. You can also use that box to ask any questions, technical questions, and our webcast producer will be glad to assist you with that. And today's presentation will be available on demand by tomorrow. So feel free to check it out again if you missed anything, you wanna go back, or if you would like to share anything with your colleagues. And in addition to webcast, campussafetymagazine.com has a lot of other helpful resources if you haven't checked it out, including newsletters, podcasts, training videos, and surveys. So feel free to check those out after the webinar. And lastly, we wanted to invite you to the Campus Safety Online Summit, which is happening November 30th and December 1st. And the summit will feature more than 16 sessions, plus two keynotes, two general sessions, and also two raffles. Everyone loves those. Um, all sessions will be available on demand for six months after the event. Um, and also most of the session and speaker info is up on the site. So you can visit CampusSafetySummit.com for more details. And today's presentation will be led by Lori Alhadef, Vice President and, oh, excuse me, Chairman, Vice Chairman of Board and President for Make Our Schools Safe. And also William Fullerton, who is Senior Vice President of Government Affairs at Centegix. And so I'll hand it over to Will and let him get started. Thanks, Amy, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thanks for joining us today. Like Amy said, my name is Will Fullerton, uh, and I oversee government and regulatory affairs at Syntegix. Um, and we are a company focused on creating safer spaces across the country and safer communities as a whole. Um, we are, um, Christ, our crisis alert system is, is bannered by a wearable panic a button. And, and because of that, um, a lot of the legislation we focus on um, looks a lot like Alyssa's law, which requires silent panic alarms in schools. Um, and I am thrilled to be joined by Lori Aladef this afternoon. Uh, Lori was raised in New Jersey and lived there for over 38 years. She graduated from the College of New Jersey with a Bachelor of Science in Health and Physical Education and a Master's of Arts in Education from Gratz College. She's a former K-12 health and physical physical education teacher. She obtained her certification in health and physical education in the state of New Jersey and her certification in health and physical education in the state of New York. She was employed for four years at Union Township School in Hampton, New Jersey, where she coached volleyball, cheerleading, and softball. She also has experience as a health and physical education teacher for children with dyslexia and language-based learning disabilities at the Windward School. For 14 years, Lori was a stay-at-home mom of her three children when her daughter Alyssa was tragically killed at Stoneman Douglas High School on February 14, 2018. Uh, after that, she founded Make Our Schools Safe, dedicated to protecting students and teachers at school. She founded the 501c3 national nonprofit organization with her husband and Alyssa's dad and became a, safe, a school safety advocate. In 2018, she was elected to the Broward uh, County School Board uh, in Florida and currently serves as District 4 board member. She's also a fundraising volunteer for the Parkland Soccer Club. And I should add, she was recently reelected to the school board in, in Broward County. Um, Lori, thanks for being here. Hey, Will, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Um, as a dad, I, I first wanted to start off and say thank you for all the work you do in focusing on making our schools safe. Um, you're an advocate and champ champion for all the country's kiddos and parents and teachers and all of us that are affected by schools in the country, which is everybody. Um, I think it's only appropriate to begin with the law's namesake. Um, and I wonder if you would mind telling us about Alyssa. Absolutely. So Alyssa was my daughter who was tragically murdered at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School on February 14th, 2018. Alyssa was in her English classroom and she was shot eight times and was murdered. Alyssa was a beautiful, vivacious, amazing 14-year-old girl. She had such zest for life. 
She was the heart of our family. Alyssa loved going to the beach, going to the mall, shopping with her friends, hanging out with boys. She loved debate and she was a great debater. And we just miss Alyssa so much. And so one of the things that, that you talk about when you, you speak on the matter um, and, and why you've become um, such a great advocate is, is the new normal a, after um, the tragedy that happened at Parkland. Um, you know, what does that look like for you, the day to day? Yeah, so absolutely. So right now I'm, I was elected to be the vice chair of the Broward County School Board. So I go to schools almost every other day, school board meetings, and then I'm also running the nonprofit organization, Make Our Schools Safe. We hold three main events each year, and um, you know there's so many details involved in that. Plus, I have two boys, so I'm a mom. I have a, a dog named Roxy, and I'm also a wife to my husband, Dr. Elon Aladev. So I have a full plate and a lot to balance. <laughs> you, you really are. Um, you know, as, as we move, move on, you, know, you what, how did Alyssa's Law come about? How, how did Make Our Schools Safe kind of decide on its true north um, and silent panic alarms and, and making sure that um, when seconds matter, um, the right first responders and law enforcement um, are, are receiving notifications? because we all know that, that time equals life in these situations. So on February 14th, I texted my daughter, Alyssa. I told Alyssa to run and hide that help was on the way. Unfortunately, that help didn't arrive fast enough to save my daughter. But for us and make our school safe, we want to hone in and focus on having mass notification so that law enforcement can get to the scene as quickly as possible. And it's their job to go in, engage, take down the threat, and then EMS to come in to triage any of the victims. So that is one of our main focuses of Make Our Schools Safe, and that we know that time equals life, and that seconds really matter. And so it's so important, it's that, threat, it's uh, geofence to the area. So law enforcement can pull up cameras, get eyes on the scene and know exactly where to go. Absolutely. Um, I think, I think you know, the powerful um, stature of your voice in all these conversations has, has really um, kind of cemented Alyssa's law across the country as, as a standard um, in saving seconds. Um, inside the first few moments uh, of, of an emergency situation in a school, whether it's a lockdown or, or anything else. Um, and because it's, it's so critical, um, these seconds are, I, I think what really makes this time equals life um, position calls, you know, call home, uh, so to speak, is the fact that first responders are receiving this notification and they're en route. You're not waking, waiting for a call from 911. Um, it hits those 911 control centers in Florida and New Jersey, and, and there's no lag. And so that uh, teachers can focus on their protocols and procedures when um, an active shooter event is, is occurring or, or any kind of emergency that requires a shelter in place. Um, it's, it's pretty black and white. And we've seen um, the first two early adopters, I'll say the first two states, your home state of, of New Jersey, originally home, and your current home state in Florida. Um, and I, I think what's neat about both of those, and we'll get to New York here in a second, um, they both go about implementing uh, these, these policies differently. Um, New Jersey, who, who the law became a law in 2019, um, it requires all the schools to in install panic alarms, which is uniform in Alyssa's law legislation. Um, and then they shorted up with a $500 billion, or sorry, million dollar package um, that, that was bond funded uh, and gave schools uh, the money they needed. Uh, in Florida, the, the, after it was passed in 2020, the DOE adopted a, a, an approved vendor list uh, of 10 vendors um, 
Strategic Crisis Alert is obviously one of those. And then they fund it every year at about $2,000 per campus. Um, and subsequently, this most recent session, they, they passed some follow-up legislation and continue, continuing the work that the Mar Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Commission is doing um, and really focused on um, school safety. Um, but I want to talk specifically about New York. Um, I think what's what's really amazing in this is, is we met over Zoom for the first time in April. And then on May 30th of this year, I got a phone call from Kit on the Make Our School Safe team. Um, and she just said, Lori and her mom are getting on a plane to Albany. How can we help? Uh, but I said, I, I said, you know, there's only three days left in New York's legislative session. Uh, the bill uh, that we're talking about had passed unanimously in the Senate, uh, but it had stalled in the, in the assembly. Technically, it had missed some critical deadlines in, in the state assembly that basically left it no path forward. Essentially, there was no way to get it to the floor for the assembly to vote on it. Um, but you wouldn't hear that, uh, and Kit wouldn't hear that. And, and I was told, figure out what we can do to help her. And you guys got on a plane. You got on a plane with, with Alyssa's grandmother, your mom, um, and you went to Albany. And, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about um, that week in Albany. Yeah, so it was super exciting. I went with my mom and so we, my goal was just to try to talk to as many legislators as possible. We wore make our school safe t-shirts and our jean jackets with all types of like pins on it, MSD strong. You know, my mom had on a jacket too, because I was like, how is anybody gonna even know who we are? And we started on the first floor and literally just went door knocking, door by door by door. And it was um, actually very interesting because like barely anybody was there. There was only a few other people like us, like lobbying for a law. And I was very, very surprised about that, but I didn't give up and we went door to door. And if people weren't there, we were taking out, we had a flyer that we made and we put it in, they had a little uh, mailbox for us to put the flyer in. And then I believe there was nine floors and my mom and I, we just, um, we just went and were able to speak with legislators and tell my story, you know, and telling them how we've passed Alyssa's law in Florida, in New Jersey already, and that this should be the next layer of school safety protection in New York. And uh, I believe, you know, we were able to convince enough people. Um, and honestly, like, I didn't really know what I was doing. <laughs> I just, um, as a, I used to be a soccer player and, you know, we never give up and we just keep going hard, keep going strong um, until we win the game or pass the law. And so we met with legislators and we did a lot of media. We tried to get a lot of news to gather interest behind Alyssa's law. And we did do that. And uh, we sat in the assembly. I remember sitting there one time just for hours, just wearing my, my jean jacket and so that the legislators could see my face. And so we eventually got a lot of support and with Alyssa's luck uh, looking down and helping us move through the New York legislative process, which as you said, Will, like it kind of was already over, but it's not over till it's over. And we got it passed through the assembly. <laughs> yeah, so ultimately, just so, so the folks who are joining us know, um, what happened on the last night of, of the legislative session is, is they pulled this the, the House version of the bill into the Ways and Committee Ways and Means Committee, which which makes the rules uh, of procedure. Um, and they stripped out all the House language, put in the Senate language um, and sent it straight to the floor uh, on third reading. So they, they broke and changed all the rules to get this done um, and passed it in the, in the wee hours. Um, they didn't want to you wouldn't let them go home until they did it, I, I would say. And it, it's really impressive. I've spent oh, close to two close to 20 years, I feel old saying that, uh, working in and out of state capitals, and it, it doesn't happen. Um, but you, you have a niece in New York, right? And, and she was um, Alyssa's cousin, who was was helpful as well. Yes, uh, Jaden Turner. And Jaden has been, was working for three years to try to pass Alyssa's law in New York. 
And so um, she, unfortunately, she got COVID that week that we were there lobbying to get Alyssa's law passed. But um, my mom was, she's amazing. She's just a fighter. She's in her 70s. And um, she was there talking to legislators and really just pushing hard to get Alyssa's law through the finish line. And so, you know, as everybody knows, like you could pass the law in the, the House and the Assembly. However, it still needs to go to the governor's desk to sign Alyssa's law into law. So we did have a, like a meeting with Governor Hochul's staff before it even passed the assembly. You know, I just try to stay as optimistic as I could be. And um, so they knew about us and uh, Alyssa's law and make our school safe. Uh, then so once the bill passed the assembly and it went to Governor Hochul's desk, she did decide to sign it, pass it into law. So. Um, Quick story, my husband and I, of course, we wanted to be there for the signing. We got on the airplane and they cancel our flight. So we could not be there for the actual signing of Alyssa's Law, but we were there virtually. And my mom and dad were able to go into New York City to be there for the signing. And then about a couple of weeks later, it was really cool. Governor Hochul invited me for coffee and cake. And we were able just to talk and about school safety and Alyssa's law for like a half an hour at the governor's office. So you had tea with the governor of, of New York, in New York City. That's that's pretty awesome. Um, and I've got the on the slide, people can see the picture. That's that's your mom in the white coat standing behind the governor. She was able to make it um, on the for the actual signing. Um, I'm going to go back real quick to Florida and New Jersey um, as we talk about um, kind of your hard work and, you know, the whole session in New York, but especially during that last week. Um, I remember you saying, look, I've got to go up there and try. Um, did you did you run into to hurdles or obstacles in Florida or New Jersey during the same kind of legislative process? So I would say not in New Jersey. I this was uh, something that New Jersey was working on. And then when the tragedy happened on February 14th, I got a call from actually a mom whose daughter was took the school bus with Alyssa in Woodcliffe Lake, New Jersey. And she said, you know, we have this bill. We would love to name it after an honor of Alyssa called Alyssa's Law. And so that's kind of just kind of happened. And uh, we did go up to the signing with Governor Murphy, who was amazing and, and signed Alyssa's law as the first state in the country. And just to be clear, Will, I want to see Alyssa's law as a standard level of school safety protection in every state across this country, just like we have our fire alarm pole stations, AEDs, now, every teacher should have their panic button so they can communicate in a life-threatening emergency situation. And I would say in Florida, you know, it was um, a lot of hard work, uh, a lot of um, me going up to Tallahassee and talking to different legislators, you know, having to tell my story over and over again. And, you know, it is very difficult for me because obviously it is very emotional and painful. But I know that Alyssa, through Alyssa's Law, will be saving lives and to keep her memory alive. It, I, you, it, your voice is very powerful. I, I can't imagine um, how difficult it is for you, but, but the impact you have um, and talking about passing it in, in every state. Um, there are bills in the United States House. Um, act, funny enough, my home congressman in Texas, um, before um, you and I met, he, he's, Roger Williams has, has filed it uh, on the federal level. Um, but as we talk about expanding into other states, um, following Uvalde in Texas, again, my home state, uh, in June, the governor, lieutenant governor and speaker of the Texas House, they, they announced $105.5 million in funding for school safety improvements. Now, $17.1 million of that was earmarked in specific language for Alyssa's Law style uh, 
silent panic alarms. Um, it reads just like the bill in Florida almost in terms of the requirements. Um, is Texas the next one to pass Alyssa's law? So I would say absolutely. I believe Texas will be the next state to pass Alyssa's law. Again, this is um, definitely a standard of school safety. This measure is so important for all of our schools to have so that they can communicate as effectively, efficiently, and have mass notification. Also being directly linked to law enforcement so that they can get on the scene as quickly as possible and save lives. Absolutely, and, and as we look at this map I've put up, um, we've obviously seen kind of the pre-funding of Alyssa's Law in Texas. Uh, I've seen draft legislation as well. Um, in Nebraska, they've continued the bill they filed last session to be refiled this session. Arizona's the same, Indiana, Michigan, Virginia and Pennsylvania are all states where I've seen it um, and, and where we feel confident, um, well, it's being drafted. If, if there is no early filing right now, it'll be filed when it opens up, um, which is October, November for most states. Um, all of these um, mandate these silent panic alarms, uh, every single bill. You can't have an Alyssa's law without mandating these silent panic alarms in every, every school, every classroom. Um, and funding obviously makes a difference. Um, an unfunded mandate is a challenge. And, and the standards, um, you know, seem to be delivering the, inert, the alert to first responders, um, but making sure campus wide folks are all aware, whether they're on the you know, fourth story of a, of a large high school or, um, you know, in a, in a classroom, in a portable, um, in a small rural elementary school, um, it makes a difference. Teachers can save lives when they have extra seconds to lock the doors, get behind something hard and secure in place. Um, and, and most states, um, I haven't seen one that's not, they put a deadline on it. They give you a school year and say by the, you know, by the beginning of net, the following school year, um, you've got to lock it in. Um, and, and following Parkland, following Uvalde, um, the conversations around um, you know, what are the, the kind of standards in school safety that need to be upheld in every state? Um, I think we're going to have a robust conversation in the spring um, at state capitals, uh, and I'm excited to have it with you. Um, we're going to open it up for questions and answers here in a minute. Um, so if anybody's got those, please, please feel free to submit them if you haven't already. Um, but before we open it up, um, Lori, I, I wanted to give you a chance as an advocate, as a champion for school safety, um, if you had anything you wanted to say, um, unrehearsed, so to speak, or any thoughts you'd like to share for any of those future advocates out of there, out there who want to get involved, um, who, who feel the urge to make sure their kids or their community is safe. So first, I want to give a shout out to Roger Williams, who filed the Safer Schools Act. It's a federal bill, H.R. 2717, that allows schools to do a school security risk assessment. Then based on this, their school's vulnerabilities, they can then apply for federal funding to help fix those issues, help fix those problems. And Alyssa's uh, law, their panic button, is you know, one of those vulnerabilities that this funding would help. So I, you know, if you know a congressman or congresswoman, please reach out to them, ask them to co-sponsor HR 2717, the Safer Schools Act. And, you know, I believe that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, and I'm on the school board, it is very difficult and challenging to prioritize, you know, what is the best school safety measure. So I think it's really important for us to continue to create layers and layers of school safety protection and that if we can get the support and the funding from our federal go government, this will absolutely help us to create a safer environment in our school. And just if a uh, shout out to makeourschoolsafe.org, please check out our website. We have a wealth of information, how you can get involved, be a volunteer for our organization. And even if you live in California, we would love for you to help join the school safety movement with Make Our Schools Safe. 
and be involved. Follow us on our social media. You know, as a as a mother, as a parent, and someone that who lost their daughter in a school shooting. I think it's so vitally important for parents to have a voice, to have a seat at the table, engage your school board members, know that you can make a difference. You know, if you see something like a door being propped open with a wedge and an unlocked door, say something, because those doors need to be locked. And there's such so much information out there. And I think, you know, listening today and being involved in the conversation is the first step but know that your voice is your power. And we would love for you to join the school safety movement by going to makeourschoolsafe.org. Absolutely. Um, you know, people, school boards, people don't realize how much impact they, you know, those elected officials like yourself um, have, have more impact on everyone's day-to-day -day life than just about anybody else up and down the ballot. Um, they are making local decisions uh, most states prioritize local control in schools, um, especially when it comes to school safety. Um, and it, it, it's massively important to thoroughly vet um, all the policies out there and make sure um, you hold folks accountable. Because if we're going to charge them with keeping our kids safe, um, I've got two little boys. Um, they're both in public school. And, and if we're going to charge these people with keeping our kids safe, um, we need to make sure they're doing so. Uh, one note, when we talk about funding on the federal level, there, it's not just a little bit of, of money in, in Congressman Williams' bill. It's $100 billion in the first year, $200 uh, billion in the second, and then $300 billion in years three through five. So, so you're talking about more than a trillion dollars over five years um, in, in making sure our kids are safe, um, that we protect every second in case of an emergency. Um, and, and that we can, and first responders can quickly be activated and arrive on scene. Um, and with that, I, th I think we'll open it up to questions. All right, great. Thank you, guys. Lori, just quickly, I like what you said about the importance of prioritizing. And that's why, like you said, site assessments are so helpful because not every school is going to have the same needs. And most schools don't have endless money. So those site assessments are really key to figuring out like what your school's main issues are. Absolutely. Oh, thank you for mentioning that. All right, so let me pop the questions out on the screen so that I have them separate. Bear with me for one second. All right, let's see. There are a looks like there's a couple questions that came in as it relates to Alyssa's Law um, in California. So someone said, what is the status of Alyssa's Law in the state of California? Is there a push to implement it? And then someone had said, how can we get Alyssa's Law passed in California? There's so much red tape here. Laura, you want to go first or you want me to? Yeah, no, I would just say that we definitely have been trying to pass Alyssa's Law in California for the last four and a half years. Unfortunately, we haven't had any movement on it, but Will, maybe you're able to add to that. No, I mean, there was a, there was a significant piece of legislation that looked like it, but it, it ultimately ran out of gas. Um, and I think the way... Um, to pass it is to call your, your, your local state representatives and senators. Um, your voice matters. Um, there was a great bill for the city of Fresno to work with the higher education community as well as the public education community um, and law enforcement community to create a, a kind of pilot program for the rest of the state of what to do um, in these kind of active shooter events, not just at schools. Um, and it looked like a good vehicle. Um, unfortunately, it, it ran out of time, uh, as bills do. I often say, you know, good, even good bills and great bills take a few sessions to pass. So don't ever be disheartened. Um, you know, it, it, it can take, you know, for significant legislation, it can take 10 years. This shouldn't be there. Um, but this next legislative session, as we begin 2023, I think your voice matters. Everybody's voice matters. Um, and the conversations should not should never be as loud as they should be this spring around school safety. Um, and, and I think parents, teachers, um, administrators, principals, wh whomever it might be, um, you know, speak up, speak out, share what your concerns are and, and, you know, make an impact. It's, you know, we're the ones who vote and, and send them, send them 
to go do this job. Um, use your feet, vote for people who represent your standards and, and, and your priorities, but don't, don't just forget it after election day. Um, keep them accountable, hold them accountable. And that kind of answers the next question, which was how to get involved locally to help. Do you guys have any, any other recommendations or? So I would, um, I just wanted to add kind of onto Will's point before. Unfortunately and tragically, this conversation of school safety doesn't become, come out of the lips of an elected official unless there is a tragic school shooting. And also it's not in the wave of the news unless there is another school shooting. And it makes me so sad. It makes me sad that we don't have schools or school boards, elected officials learn from the tragedies and the deaths that occurred at Uvalde in, in Parkland. And it breaks my heart. So I would say as parents, you know, know what the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Act is. Go to makeourschoolsafe.org and, and see what else you can do as a parent, how you can get involved and make an impact and make a difference locally at your child's school. And there's, you know, certain foundational school safety measures, like every door is locked. The front door of the school should be locked that uh, this you know, school needs to have a way to effectively communicate in a uh, crisis situation. There's a lot of different things that we can do from more mental health, making that a priority, and um, making sure that these risk assessments, every school should have a risk assessment. That could be a question as a parent, you can ask your principal, did, you know, did our school have a risk assessment done? Were those vulnerabilities fixed? And if you know, there is no funding, you can, as a parent, help to raise money to help fix your single point of entry. Make sure that you have fencing. Um, it's so important that there's behavioral threat assessments being done to make sure we rule out it's a transient threat or not. And every school should have a way for whether it's a parent or a student to report something, see something, say something, and have a way to report it, whether it's on an app or report it anonymously. I don't even care if you have a box at the front office, but we have to give empower people to be able to prevent violence, prevent threats before they happen. Absolutely. I think that's it, right? Just don't wait for the funding to come, right? Start demanding it. Um, the Biden administration just released the first billion of, of 4.25 billion for the Safer Communities Act. That's um, they will allow states to prioritize districts with the greatest needs. Um, usually, it's formulaic, so every district gets X percentage um, based on a formula. Um, this gives states, state education agencies, SEAs, the ability to prioritize those districts with the largest needs. Um, so again, if you speak up, uh, explain those needs, uh, explain how timely it is and how necessary it is today. Um, we can't wait. Um, you know, it's, it, if you wait around on the speed of government, you could be waiting forever, right? Um, you have to get involved. Um, I'm a recovering bureaucrat myself, and, and sometimes the inertia inside a, a bureaucracy will slow down to a crawl. Um, that's not necessarily on the agency. It is just... A lot of times they are they are understaffed, underpaid, and overworked, and so we've got to lift our voices up. Um, and if you're not talking to the right ear, find the right ear, scream louder um, until they can't ignore you anymore. Yeah, I like what you said about sometimes it it takes more than one try. That makes me think of a lot of people that we speak to that are applying for grants, especially federal grants. They might not get it the first time, but the good thing about federal grants is most of the time they'll tell you what was wrong or what what they didn't like or whatever in your submission and to just just keep trying the money's there um so that's one thing that i've learned from a lot of speaking to a lot of people in this space well and and there's a there's a bill in, in both the u.s house and, and the u.s senate um to to free up arpa dollars or, or all these esser dollars that are outstanding in the second and third round um for school safety um it 
it likely won't have traction because the deadline for, for round two is not till next September and then the following September for the last round. Um, but again, coming January, um, those conversations are going to be had. It is hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, and if we're not prioritizing school safety um, and the mental health and well-being of our, our students alongside of, of what um, any learning loss or whatever they might have ex experienced coming out of COVID, um, you know, it's, it's a conversation that's ongoing. And it is a lot of money for schools to help their kids and to protect their kids. Absolutely. And I, I don't know, Lori, if this the, someone was saying, how about a community p petition process such as using change.org to gain political attention? Did you do that in, in your journey to get this pushed through in some states at all? Did you find that helpful if you did? So we do have actually a, a change.org petition on our website now. Um, is it helpful? I mean, I think everything helps trying at, from every different angle. I think uh, just we, we've been doing this very grassroots, meaning we're just making phone calls. We're having volunteers go down the list of legislators and picking up the phone and calling them and asking them to support Alyssa's law and to vote yes. Um, so I think doing it that way, we've also done postcard campaigns where we have volunteers filling out postcards trying to get the Safer Schools Act passed at the federal level. So I think going about this at different ways, whether it's um, emailing, phone calls, through the petitions, they're all very vitally important. But I think the most important and effective way is whether going in person and being physically present. What I did in New York and passing Alyssa's Law in New York would not have happened if I stayed here in Florida. Me being present, them seeing, you know, the mother of Alyssa who had their daughter shot and killed in school, it was a, definitely a much harder conversation for them to say no to me or ignore me than it would be would have been if I just sent an email. Right. That's, right let's see. Next question. How Sorry, go ahead. No, it's fine. Go ahead, Will, if you want to add something. No, it, it would not have passed in New York without Lori. That is 100% true. Um, she, she really pulled it across the finish line. She put the entire assembly on her back. And as you know, you, you hear terms like whip to the Senate, or whip to the House, um, or whip to the minority party. Um, she, she whipped those votes. Um, and, and it's hard. I mean, I'm sure everybody, can you imagine telling Lori no um, to her face if you're a New York assemblyman? Um, all parents, all teachers, everybody involved with schools in, in the country have that ability. Um, make them look you in the eye and tell you that school safety isn't a priority. Make them tell you they want to do other things. Awesome. Thank you for adding that. And how is this law different from Ray Baum's act that requires a 911 call to provide a location of the call within a building? I'm, I'm not overly familiar with Brain Palm Act that provides um, a location um, of the call. But our solution, Crisis Alert, you, you'll see a picture of the badge here on, on the screen. Um, it connects with strobes and intercoms and everything to deliver multiple alerts. But through that connection to the strobe, we give physical location, room level data to first responders on a, on a digitized kind of blueprint of the school, uh, agnostic to what floor it's on. Um, they know exactly on their way to an event, they know exactly where the where the alert has been triggered, where the first cry for help rang out. Um, and so I think that's that's a valuable piece of information to have with those for those first responders. If, if we are talking about seconds saving lives, um, every second we save uh, can save a life um, or multiple. And so, so location accuracy is, in, is amazingly important. Um, and I think it should be a consideration um, for all school districts, for parents, uh, for safety audits, whatever we're talking about. It can be, how do we save these seconds? How are we giving campus level responders, um, 911 first responders, everyone, um, all the tools they need um, before and while they're en route? so that they can act when they get there. Thank you. 
This person said, as a school board member in Texas myself, I agree it can be hard to prioritize funding for specific areas. School safety should not be one of those. Is there a way for active parent organizations in districts to partner with Make Our Schools Safe? These groups have loud voices in districts and eager to help. So I'd say absolutely. Please go to our website, makeourschoolsafe.org. We have a contact form. You can fill out the information. We're always looking to collaborate with different PTOs, PTAs, and on school safety projects, because our goal is to help you make those, whatever those safety projects are, maybe you want to put a stop the leak kit in every classroom. Maybe you need um, fencing for a stronger single point of entry. So we are absolutely uh, willing and wanting to partner with organizations to help make their school safety project come to fruition. And I'd say specifically to Texas, just because I, I live in Austin um, and I'm based there. Um, the governor last Friday night in his debate um, against his challenger um, pledged to include school safety as an emergency item during the Texas legislative session. Now, now what that means is in Texas, um, when they go into session on January 10th, I believe, um, they really can't, by constitution, cannot pass anything or even hear anything for the first 30 days. And really, they don't pass anything for the first 60 those emergency items they can get to work on immediately. So as soon as they get there um, and the governor declares it an official emergency item, those conversations are live. And so now is the time. Um, bill filing, pre-filing in Texas starts, I want to say November 10th. Um, so we're about a month away from that. These conversations are happening. Um, there have been hearings all summer, obviously. Um, and it's it's a great time to get be engaged because they are they need input. They need input from educators and school board members. Um, you know, school districts are diverse across the country. They're big and small, urban and rural, um, but they look like our country, and that's the great thing about them. There's no one-size-fits-all solution, but a Alyssa's Law piece of policy um, can work everywhere. Absolutely. All right, we have a couple more questions to get to. What is the basic requirement to meet Alyssa's Law? This person said, I heard that school only need one device to be able to initiate the alert silently. Is that true? It, it varies by state. Um, and so the, in New York, they define it um, specifically as what um, a silent panic alarm is um, by statute. And then they open it up um, for available funding that funds all other school safety needs. Um, in New Jersey, um, the requirement was basically one one per building. Um, in Florida, um, that you've seen this approved vendor list, um, it is more. It is not one per building. Um, while there's nothing that says um, you have to have more than one, um, the DOE and districts have gone with options that give um, every um, or as many educators as possible an alert. Uh, a panic button, if you will. Um, our system, we, we give every single staff member on campus a badge. And, and I think that's what you need. You need as many eyes and ears inside a school um, to trigger um, an alarm, an alert, a lockdown, whatever it might be. Um, you, need, you need every asset you can, you can get um, and you need to empower all of those educators on campus. And so, you know, it's only passed in three states so far. And so, as other states pass and implement it, um, like I said, it, it looks very different in all three states so far. Um, as we pass it in the other 47, and, and then we add the, the outlying territories, um, it can look like what it needs to look like per state. And that input from teachers, from parents, from students, again, it, it is really powerful in, in saying this is what we want, this is what we think we need, this is what we know we need, um, and driving those conversations to policymakers' ears. I'd like to just add, I think it's important to say that Alyssa's law is not just for an active shooter situation. It is yeah. used majority of the time for a medical situation that we have every day in our schools. So I just wanted to make that point. It's a great point. 99.9% .9 of the uses of our system is every day. A kid's choking on the playground. There's a fight in the hallway. Um, 
it is it is a huge asset to SROs, again, to, to kind of the first responders on campus, not the 911 first responders, um, to, to mitigate, hopefully de-escalate a situation um, and get help when, when a student or a teacher needs it. Thank you for adding that. And Laura, I feel like you mentioned this before. This person asked, what do you use to do a school risk assessment? Do you, do you recommend a specific tool or know of one? I have a recommendation if you don't, but. Well, I would just say that it should be a uh, school safety expert person that would come to your school and they have a certain list that they would go through and then they would present you with a report. Yep. There's a, a group called REMS TA Center, which I had to look it up because I always forget the acronym Readiness and Emergency Management for Schools Technical Assistance Center. And there it's a K through 12 site assessment resources. And there's a ton of good information on there. And if you go to Campus Safety's website too, and you search for that term, even if you just search for REMS, there's a lot of articles, contributed articles that we've had from people, um, you know, basically testifying that that it's a great re resource. So. Well, and in, in 37 of the 50 states, um, really in the last several years, um, after after Parkland, most states, 37 out of 50, have, have um, developed, um, established a school safety center of, of some sort. Um, so look for the one in your school, I mean, your state. They should have some resources for you, um, but they definitely will have guidelines. Um, I, I think if, if the requirements for an audit you don't feel they are robust enough, again, do something, uh, say something, and, and get involved. Okay, let me see. We have one more question. What companies are helping schools, what companies are helping schools to do these risk assessment? Um, HR 2717, is this something that can be done by private companies as well to help schools along? And if so, where can these resources be found? So the, the law hasn't been passed yet. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know necessarily, you know, what guidelines they would put around that. But the company like you just mentioned, uh, I know Safe Havens is another uh, group. But, you know, I think it's experts in school safety that can go through your campus. I mean, you have, whether it's school resource officers, I mean, they know what those vulnerabilities are. But it's very important to have that plan so then you know what needs to be prioritized and fixed and what those vulnerabilities are. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's all we have for questions. I don't know if you guys want to add anything or I can close it out. Yes. I would just like to add one thing. Um, thank you so much. I think this is such an important conversation. Please go to makeourschoolsafe.org to find out more information on Alyssa's Law, how to pass Alyssa's Law in your state. And also the other thing that our focus is on is Make Our School Safe Clubs, where students help to create the culture of safety within their school and how to start a Make Our School Safe Club at your high school. Fill out the contact form and so we can provide you with additional information. Thank you. Yeah, I would say Parkland was just like such a big catapult seeing all these students. So the first time really seeing a big student force advocating and clearly it makes a difference. So thank you for sharing that. Um, thank you again, Lori and Will, and thank you all for attending today's webinar and also for to Centegix for being today's sponsor. Um, as mentioned earlier, if you want to watch this webcast again or share it with your colleagues, a recording will be available on CampusSafetyMagazine.com. By tomorrow it's usually within a couple hours but i always like to say tomorrow just in case um we love to hear your feedback on this presentation and we know that our presenters appreciate it as well so please just take a few minutes to complete our survey it'll pop up on the screen when you go to leave the webcast so thank you again laurie will and have a great rest of the week everyone thanks thank everyone you.